Um, so I'm Megan Cooper. I'm a pediatric investigator here at Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome to ICTS at Venture Cafe, um, which is a collaboration between our um, ICTS institutions at Washington University, um, St. Louis University, and um, Missouri, uh, University of Missouri, and uh, the Venture Cafe. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Emery Toker today. Um, Emery is the um, co-director of the Entrepreneurship for Biomedicine program at Washington University and the Entrepreneurship Mentor in Residence at the University of Arizona. He has extensive experience as a scientist, entrepreneur, mentor, and angel investor. Um, he studied physics and electrical engineering and founded three biomedical technology research companies that were all later acquired by larger firms. He is a member of several angel investment groups and is currently pursuing his fourth biomedical startup a company. So he's here today to talk to us about how to start a healthcare startup. Um, please feel free to enter your comments into the chat box um, and we will um, get to all of the comments uh, by the end of the talk. So the floor is yours, Emery. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Megan. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll get right into it. Uh, so we're going to be talking about starting a healthcare startup. And you may be asking yourself, how are you going to do that in one hour? And in fact, uh, starting a healthcare startup is uh, relatively easy. The bigger question is how to start a successful healthcare startup. And that's what we're going to try to cover uh, in just one hour. And success, you know, we could spend a little bit of time maybe on the definition of success. So a successful startup might be one that is uh, aims to scale and capture the entire galaxy, or it could be a little clinic or a coffee shop. Uh, but you know, we know success when we see it, I think. So that's the kind of working definition of successful for us. So this slide says bottom line first. So let's read the bottom line. The reality is that the probability of moving, transitioning from an interest in entrepreneurship to success in entrepreneurship is about one in a thousand historically, which is rather depressing, but it's really useful, I think, to work on uh, the historical reasons why this transition turns out to be so difficult. In my personal experience, the reasons are unwillingness to do the grunt work, and there is no way of escaping it because there's a relentless filtration process from 1,000 to one, a lack of knowledge about the entrepreneurial process, which is easily compensated, I think, and uh, another very important one, a lack of wisdom in general. And so this is basically the summary of my talk, and we're going to dive into each of these three processes as much as we possibly can. And the reality is that we have only 45 minutes. Um, I have 92 slides. I'm not going to go through all 92, I don't think, and I'll be zipping along as fast as I can. And I hope that you will deposit questions for me in the chat box as we do this. So I'll do a little bit of introductions, uh, a little bit of philosophy, then some pragmatic tools and some words for those people who are really serious uh, about this uh, activity. So uh, unfortunately, we had some technical problems and we can't do a poll right now, but uh, the two questions I would have asked you, the second one being much more important than the first one would be, the first one is, how much do you think you know about starting a startup? And some of you may feel like you know, you're know you experts. Some of you may say I'm a total novice. And some of you may say I have an academic training in entrepreneurship, but uh, not much practical experience. So I'm going to have to, without the poll, I'm going to have to make an assumption that uh, all of you are somewhere in between and try to talk to the edges of the distribution uh, also as much as possible. What is much more important is this question. How interested are you truly in starting a startup in the foreseeable future? And this is a loaded question as we're going to see, because my experience is that I know of no successful entrepreneur who was a reluctant entrepreneur. All the successful entrepreneurs I have met personally myself 
have said, including myself, I cannot not do this, or I cannot not try this entrepreneurship. That's how interested I am in it. I'm not going to take you know, ridiculous risks with my career and my finances and so on and so forth, but I really, really want to give this the best shot that I possibly can. Otherwise, you know, you could learn about entrepreneurship and so on, but the process is so difficult, the filtration is so tight that if you're a reluctant entrepreneur, I'm afraid you may end up uh, becoming a, an unsuccessful entrepreneur. Okay, so uh, I'll spend very little time introducing myself, uh, just the relevant points. So the first one is uh, I'm a co-director of this entrepreneurship for biomedicine program uh, at Washington University. This is my email address. You can shoot me an email anytime that you like. This is the website of the program. You can go and visit it. And I'll talk about this entrepreneurship for biomedicine program at the kind of near to the end of our talk. Uh, this takes about half my time. And then the other half, I'm, a, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a good title, you know, I wish I had thought of it, uh, Innovator in Residence at the University of Arizona, which means I assist uh, faculty and students with uh, great ideas in uh, attempting to commercialize those ideas. So that's basically what I do. I'll talk to you a little bit about my background, but relating it to the topic at hand, uh, this is my academic background, but what uh, makes it relevant, I think, is that this college called Reed College in Portland, Oregon, uh, the word applied is never used there. It's only, uh, you know, Plato and Socrates and uh, humanities, um, anthropology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I got my basis in the liberal arts and humanities at this college. Then I went to Caltech and the University of Arizona. More at Caltech, the, uh, the only thing that's talked about is applied uh, technology. So there was this combination of liberal arts and humanities and applied technology. And at my startups, I used to tell my wife that 95% of what I do is based on human psychology and 5% is everything else including all the technical training that I had. <clears throat> so this combination is, I think, what uh, enabled me to do some things that I'll talk to you about in a little bit. Another kind of perhaps interesting aspect of my background is that I had no, no business training whatsoever, never took a single business course in my life. And <clears throat> that, uh, I don't think that hurt me at all, uh, with all due respect to the business schools everywhere, because there's a major difference between training to be an MBA and attempting to become a startup founder. My personal belief, uh, debatable of course, is that uh, uh, a business is common sense at the state of trying to form a new startup maybe not so much at the MBA level, but all that I dealt with as far as business is concerned was uh, answered by just uh, common sense, I felt. So uh, despite having had no business background and just you know physics, electrical engineering, uh, I was able to form uh, three medical device companies all related to breast cancer. And all three of them were uh, acquired, that's what exit means, by larger companies, either public companies or uh, private equity firms. Uh, the time from starting the company to selling the company on the average was about seven year cycle in each of these uh, three cases. For the last 20 years, I've been involved in early stage investing, so-called seed investing, uh, myself and my colleagues. Uh, small amounts of initial money, typically for university generated uh, technologies is what we have done. And uh, depending on the time, you know, there is some stories here too. I must admit, I have not been as successful in investing as I've been in creating my own companies. And there's some lessons to be learned there too. Uh, and some people argue uh, that entrepreneurship uh, is a genetic defect and that it's kind of in your blood 
So even at my age, I'm still very much involved in startups. In fact, I'm the CEO of four university startups, uh, one in educational technology, one in medical technology, and two in uh, green technology areas. Uh, CEO doesn't really deserve the term CEO because at this stage of the game, there is uh, not a tremendous amount of work yet. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. It's kind of establishing what it is that we want to do, how we're going to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So at this stage, the general question that I get is, well, tell us about uh, either you know, your prior companies or the ones that, uh, that you're working on today. So I'm going to tell you about one of them that I'm quite interested in. And I'm going to try to shoot multiple birds with one stone by telling you about that uh, company. Um, so the first bird that I wanna shoot is uh, the need, I believe, to be able to very concisely summarize the value exchanges is what I'm calling it, uh, associated with the startup that I have in mind in a single slide. And so I'm going to describe to you this startup that I'm working on and incorporate into the description uh, some of the concepts that we'll be talking about in just a few minutes. So, uh, this is the structure that I built for our company. And this is our company in gray. And for better or worse, at the moment, it's called Plasmando. Mando, like in manger in French, uh, eat and plastics, uh, except that it sounds a little bit like plasma, so I don't like it. We may change it. But uh, that's neither here nor there for now. So uh, the things that I want to point out here is, you know, from our company, money is going to go out this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. So a lot of money is going to go out of our company and some money is going to come into our company. And the question is, will the money coming in exceed the money that's going out in kind of steady state? Okay, so what does this company do? So our company buys post-consumer uh, PET uh, waste, like plastic bottles and so on, from the commodity market. And it may be surprising to you, but you still have to pay people to buy their plastic waste from them. You would think that they would give it to you willingly or even pay you to pick it up, but no, you have to pay them some money. So we take that plastic waste, we do some pre-processing on it, like mechanical processing, shredding it perhaps, cleaning it perhaps, et cetera. All of that causes us to spend some energy, uh, capital equipment and labor costs. And we have developed some proprietary engineered enzymes that uh, eat essentially this plastic and generate some end products, sellable end products. And that we call enzymatic biodegradation. We subcontract out the production of these engineered enzymes to a company like Novozyme, and we have to pay them money. Not everything is converted into sellable products. Uh, so there is some waste product that we ourselves produce and those go into the landfill. And then the final sellable products after these, uh, these uh, end products are generated by the enzymatic biodegradation, we sell them to people who sell uh, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, et cetera, plastic bottles. They're called pet resin manufacturers and some names here. And so this is kind of uh, the equation in my mind as I decide whether this is a good opportunity or not. What are some of the other aspects? You know, it's a, it's a increasing problem. You know, everybody is talking about uh, the pet, the plastic waste that we're generating. These companies want to do something about it in the beginning. They want to seem like they're doing something about it, but eventually they will have to do something real about it. So uh, it looks like it's, uh, it's going to be an increasing problem. That's a plus. That's an attraction to me. The second one is it's not clear whether it will work or not. If it were clear that it would work, then everybody else would be doing it. So this aspect of non-obviousness, I call it, is also, believe it or not, an attraction to us. The third one is that uh, it lends itself to injecting ever increasing amounts of resources, money into this process. At the moment, we have demonstrated uh, proof of concept at the Petri dish level. 
Then we'll put in some more money to uh, prove the process at kind of the kilogram level. And then we're going to have to inject a lot of more money to prove that the process works at the tons type level. So this is um, going back to here. Each of you who are thinking about starting a startup in your own mind, not for investors, for yourself, would be, uh, it would be good to have in your mind a value exchange uh, schematic uh, like this. Bird number two, getting comfortable with unknowns. So the thing about entrepreneurship and startups is it's a world of unknowns. We don't know anything whatsoever. We don't know if the customer will buy. We don't know what price they'll pay. We don't know how much it's going to cost us to produce it. And successful entrepreneurs are comfortable in this domain of a tremendous amount of unknowns. But the thing to do is to make all these unknowns into adjustable variables and have an outcome that is based on those variables. So for example, in my case, the key is uh, for one ton of pet waste, how many kilograms of TPA and uh, ethylene glycol can we produce? We don't know. Well, if I don't know something, I just make it a variable. So from 10% to 90%. The other unknowns I put down here, and there could be a slew of them. So for example, cost of acquiring and processing one ton of pet post-consumer pet. And I can move this around the nominal number of 160 and this entire graph will adjust itself automatically. And I'm going to tell you how to do this. This is a free, very convenient, superb tool available to you. Uh, of course, production capacity is important because of economies of scale and so on. Uh, and then the price of the, the end product, the sellable end product is important. So I can vary those two. And on this y-axis is the profitability of the company. So without, basically without lifting a finger uh, in terms of you know, getting my hands dirty, I'm able to take a look at all the unknowns and make an assessment of how likely is this uh, startup to succeed. So uh, for example, I would say, well, I need to see 70%, 80% conversion uh, ratio by weight. And let's say at the moment in the lab, we're at 30% conversion ratio by weight. So that's, that's okay. I know what risks I'm taking. As we scale up, this number can go down or it may go up, but I'll be monitoring like a hawk, this variable as reality starts asserting itself, as well as these variables that are uh, discoverable in the, in the general uh, marketplace and in publications. So when you, you know, the question starts off with, uh, so what does tell us about one of these companies? Uh, the way I attempted to tell you is through this graph and this graph. Uh, that's, that's, how I, that's how I look at things, but I'm an engineer by training. So everything is numbers to me and narrative comes uh, next, but uh, some of you may have a different approach, you know, storytelling first, numbers next but numbers makes me more comfortable. So a little bit more uh, of this philosophy associated with you know, wisdom, knowledge, and grunt work. So let's leave grunt work uh, to the side for a second because it's only grunt work and take a look at this. So a lot of information here probably, but let's say that you're at this point, you're just starting off. I mentioned to you that in a uh, steady state, 95% of what I did was psychology and 5% was uh, you know, uh, everything technical and otherwise. So let's start uh, dealing with the easier side first, the acquisition of knowledge associated with the entrepreneurial process. Many of you may have seen this type of thing before. So, you know, the typical sequence is you have to identify a problem, you have to form a team around it, you have to think of solutions, you have to validate those solutions, and then you have to present some type of a plan uh, to yourself, to your co-founders, and then eventually maybe to investors, et cetera. There's a lot of detail underneath each one of these. So identifying a problem to be solved, an emerging problem or 
a problem that you foresee coming is much better than a problem that everybody is aware of already. So you want to find you know, undiscovered places. So in terms of identifying some problem, I would say uh, not only do you need to be able to define the problem, quantify the problem, the depth of it, as well as its extent, uh, but uh, the timing of the problem. Timing is one of the highest correlators with success, it turns out. Form competent team seems very, you know, trivial on the outside, but uh, having had experience with lots of entrepreneurs and lots of teams and so on, uh, what I've seen is that if you're a, I'll give you by example, if you're a biologist, you're going to try to surround yourself with, with other biologists because you can talk to them. Uh, on the other hand, the optimal solution might be in chemistry to the problem that you're attempting to solve. So when forming a team, not only competence, but diversity in this very general sense of diversity uh, turns out to be extremely important also. Uh, same similar thing with uh, solutions. Uh, most successful startups have come from non-obvious solutions, meaning if everybody that you see says, oh, this is a fantastic solution, that should be a yellow flag. Some people need to say to you almost, this is never going to work. Are you, are you stupid or what? Uh, that is actually a good answer uh, to hear sometimes. That means that your solution is a non-obvious solution. The whole name of the game is in here validating promising solutions, comma, as cheaply as possible and as quickly as possible, which I didn't show here, which we're going to talk to you about a little bit more in a second. And then everybody wants to hear something big. So you need to excite people by uh, explaining to them if this works as envisioned, as exercised, as imagined, this is what its impact can be which means you're a big thinker, you're ambitious, you have big goals, but you're also intelligent enough to start uh, small, demonstrate something small and make sure that it works and then build upon it. So this idea of think big, start small plan is important. As I mentioned to you, this is easy to teach, easy to learn because after all it's knowledge. Uh, the difficult side is on the wisdom side and on the wisdom side, some things are easier than others. So, for example, in order to identify a good problem that needs to be solved, whose time has come, you need to have strong observational powers. Most great entrepreneurs are walking around looking for opportunity everywhere they go. So improving observational powers, looking for problems that could be solved is something that can be learned. But this one, overcoming fear of rejection. You wouldn't believe how many startups die because of this, overcoming the fear of rejection. So for example, associated with forming a competent team, uh, you want to go and convince somebody to join your team and really fight with you all the way, but you're worried that uh, they're going to reject you. And for evolutionary reasons, basically, I suppose, this fear of rejection is deeply embedded in us so it will prevent us from doing things that are necessary to, to go through this one in a thousand uh, conversion uh, rate. Improving cre uh, creative thinking is similar to improving observational powers. I think this is possible uh, through some exercise and learning and so on to enable yourself to come up with uh, brainstorm solutions, but overcoming the fear of failure is similar to overcoming the fear of rejection in that this is a, a showstopper uh, a lot for many entrepreneurs. So I don't hear mean, uh, you know, get crazy and mortgage the house and, you know, take crazy chances with your career and so on. But there is a way that I'm going to talk to you about in a second of how to incrementally overcome your fear of failure and to be able to assess risk reward profile at any given time, uh, carefully and analytically. Uh, and then this is another key feature of successful entrepreneurs, at least those that I've seen is 
to have very high confidence level, uh, almost to the level sometimes it comes across as uh, uh, touching arrogance. So you need to control against that. So confidence with humility uh, goes along with the start small and think big uh, concept here. Okay, so now on the process side, wisdom, knowledge, and then the process. So the process actually is the easiest, but you know one has to go through these steps. Uh, some are trickier than others. So before you start a company, it's important to determine uh, the ownership and the governance of the company. Uh, ownership and governors are, governance are independent. So for example, when we invest in a company, we may have uh, only 10% of the company in equity in ownership, but we will have total uh, governance authority in the sense that we reserve for ourselves uh, the ability to veto certain decisions, for example, certain key decisions. So these are some of the things that you need to think of before going through the procedural aspects of setting up a company. Uh, generating an articles of organization and operating agreement, acquiring some numbers uh, that are governmental numbers that are necessary for you to be able to submit a small business commercialization grant application, which for any type of healthcare company in my mind is the way to go. Uh, it's free money available from the government. Uh, so if I were starting a company or with all the companies that I have started, this is the sequence that I have followed uh, in terms of you know the, the process that uh, has to be followed. Just a bit more philosophy and then we'll go to the tools and such. So because I'm a, an investor and an educator and so on and so forth, I see approximately 1,000 new ideas per year. Everybody coming and asking me, you know, is this a good idea? Is this a good idea, et cetera. And as you all know, there is a lot of resources available uh, in terms of you know, supporting uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, from my experience, I call a vast majority of those uh, feel good resources aplenty. And in my personal experience, as well as my uh, colleague investors, this input, this feel good resources aplenty uh, reduces the 1000 raw ideas into 990 half-baked ideas. The other 10 completely drop out. So not much of a transition here. The big transition occurs here uh, from 990 to roughly 20, where the input is strictly the time, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the ability of the founder to cope with rejection. So it's all in the founder's hands, this large transition from 990 to 20. It's not really a function of how much education you gave them in entrepreneurship. Is It's whether they have the willingness to give uh, their time, blood, sweat, tears, etc. And then even if you have an idea, and notice I say the idea now, and not half-baked idea is an idea where there's some evidence that if you were to build it, they might buy. So that's the transition that we made. The transition from this stage to investable idea, unfortunately, but reality requires connections. The fact that you have a great idea is, does not mean it's an investable idea until you have some connection. So one of the recommendations I make to young people is to as early as possible, start developing connections with uh, people who are five steps, 10 steps ahead of you all the time. And then even with all of the above, this from the 1000 ideas, we get one successful idea. So how depressing, uh, but this transition is the key transition, obviously. And again, the name of the game is to know that we're going to fail most of the time. And the trick is to fail as cheaply as possible, as rapidly as possible, but with the ability to learn something from the failure that can be applied to the next idea that comes along that you want to test, that you want to check out. So uh, this is uh, what the way I look at the ideas that are coming into 
my funnel. And my first question is, do, does the team or the founder have the ability to take this from 990 to 20? Because after that, we can easily help with our networks and our money, et cetera. Another thing, part of the philosophy to make sure that you have clearly identified in your mind is the difference between the horse and the jockey. So the horse is the idea that you have. It could be a very strong idea, uh, like a thoroughbred, or it could be a mule, you know, a really bad idea. And the jockey is the founder, the person who's going to ride this horse to success. So we see two cases. Uh, we see a very strong jockey, very ambitious, very smart, uh, very ethical, on a really bad horse. Uh, and in that case, our attempt is to make sure that we can train the jockey so that if and when the jockey come across, comes across a thoroughbred later on in life, that they have all the tools necessary to ride that thoroughbred to success. This happens with uh, students mostly. The reverse happens uh, typically you know, with faculty where the horse is fantastic, a lot of grant money went in, uh, tremendous idea, patent applications, etc. But the jockey, in some cases, um, is a great scientist, but is uh, weak on the what people call coachability side, because coachability sounds a little bit of like uh, looking down on somebody. Let me tell you how to do this kind of thing. But uh, it is necessary to listen to others who have gone through the process. The fact that you know uh, a particular aspect of science incredibly well does not automatically translate into you knowing uh, the nitty gritty dirty aspects of uh, running a startup uh, as well also. So in your mind, separate out the jockey from the horse. Uh, the horse is gonna keep coming, new horses are keep gonna come along your way and your job is to pick up all the tools necessary to write the thoroughbred when it comes along. So some of you may have seen this slide if you have listened to my other presentations. You know, the reason why it's so difficult to beat the odds is that not only do you have to have book smarts, but you have to have street smarts to win at entrepreneurship. Not only do you need to have the ability to think analytically, you know, 10 steps ahead, but you also know how to beat people at poker by bluffing, by reading their faces, etc. And not only do you need to understand the language and culture of science and technology, but you also understand the language of culture of business and liberal arts. So in terms of like an example of book smarts versus street smarts, when I talk to students, I say, uh, you know, I flipped the coin 50 times and it came heads 50 times. What's the probability that it will come heads uh, 51st time? And, you know, everybody raises their hands 50%. So that's the book smart. The street smart is the coin is likely rigged uh, because it's incredibly low probability that it would come 50 times in a row as uh, heads. So therefore, it's a high probability that it will come up heads again because the coin is rigged. Uh, that's the street smart part of things, just to give you an example of what I mean by this. So uh, combining these two, one has to have this cold, analytical, quantitative, rational, no mercy outlook at uh, everything that's quantitative, as well as everything that is based on uh, emotions and evolution. You know, the stuff that we talked about, courage to fail, understanding human psychology, ethics and values, etc. You can have all of this and very weak here, you'll fail at entrepreneurship. I mean, you'll be a fantastic professor or whatever researcher, but you'll fail at entrepreneurship. You may have all of this incredibly passionate about what you're doing, but you're unable to take a cold, hard look at things, you will fail. And it's very difficult to combine these two in the same brain. So that's why typically, you know, you have two uh, founders of a startup, one providing this side and the other one providing this side of the equation. All right, so I wanna jump quickly, that's the philosophy part, quickly to pragmatic tools. 
So how to start a healthcare startup? If any of you are thinking of starting a healthcare startup, the first thing I would ask you is answer these following questions. Uh, it's, this is modified from a well-known uh, algorithm, let's say, you know, what problem are you solving? And articulate it and quantify it using absolutely no jargon. And so many people are have tremendous difficulty doing this. You know, it seems very simple on the surface here when we look at it, but it's really difficult. How is it addressed today? What are the limits of current practice? What's your new approach? Why do you think it'll be successful? Who cares? This is the, if you make it, will they buy? You know, if you're successful, what difference will it make? What are the risks sequentially, you know, uh, today, tomorrow, next day? Uh, how much will it cost to de-risk? And how long will it take to de-risk? Again, step by step, you won't be able to de-risk in just one single step. And what are the success metrics associated with these quantifiable success metrics associated with these de-risking activities? So this would enable me and others like me to get a sense as to, at a layman level, what it is that you're talking about. The second thing is the thing that I mentioned to you before, getting comfortable with unknowns. Because we're talking about healthcare, uh, this is another variation of what I showed you before. So many of you are attempting to come up with a uh, innovation that aims at reducing an adverse outcome that is being seen today, like patients spending a lot of time in the emergency room or you know, therapy taking too long, et cetera, et cetera. There's always some adverse outcome and your innovation is going to reduce that adverse outcome. But at the moment, you don't know whether it will reduce it by 10% or by 90%. So make it a variable, potential efficacy of your proposed solution. And for example, you say, you know, with very limited uh, number of cases, we, at the moment, we're showing, you know, 70% reduction in adverse outcomes, but plus or minus 20% or 30% is possible. Give us some money and we'll tighten that uncertainty associated with this reduction. So the reduction in adverse outcome generates typically a savings to the healthcare system, right? Uh, because, and this is, uh, uh, you can find this information, how much is the adverse outcome costing the healthcare system? The savings to the healthcare system will generate the market price, what people or Medicare or insurance companies might be willing to pay for this innovation based on the savings that it's generating. And that, then translates into, after you have a, some idea about the cost of producing your innovation, uh, an idea about this internal rate of return. In other words, how much is the potential return on investment, both social and financial, going to be as a function of the reduction in adverse outcomes? There's a whole bunch of other uh, variables that you don't know. So for example, how much is the innovation cost to develop and to manufacture, you know, if it's a device manufacturing it in a unit on a unit by unit basis, that would be a variable. How much total investment required uh, will be a variable. How many years might it take until somebody comes and buys you out might be another variable. And uh, the mathematics behind uh, the relationship between all these variables and the final outcome, which is the potential return on investment, is uh, not so complex. And I'm more than happy to assist any one of you who wants assistance in terms of getting that math and the Excel uh, to work. I'll give you the source of the, the tool in just one second to you. Now, some of you may say, well, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, true how do I find these nominal numbers? And honestly, the nominal numbers are almost always available if you just look hard enough. So for example, if you have a FDA, a product that requires FDA clearance, there is statistical data on the time it takes and the amount of money to be spent, uh, even on a kind of uh, disease by disease or modality by modality basis, 
some uh, historical benchmarks against pretty much every assumption that is going to go into your calculations. And that too may require some either grunt work or some connection to a person who has already done the grunt work and created some, uh, you know, either mental database or a physical database of such uh, benchmarks associated with the type of idea that you have in your mind. So um, I'm going to zip through the rest. I'm not going to talk at all anymore. You need to get comfortable with technology, uh, terminology, I, I'm sorry. This idea of you know, starting off with fuzzy and uncertain assumptions, and then trying to reduce those uncertainties associated with your assumptions so that your picture of the future converges towards reality. So in the best case, the, your assumptions, as you start validating them, may be moving in the right direction towards you know, success, and the uncertainties are shrinking. But often they will go in the negative direction. And this will show that uh, your initial assumptions were incorrect as the uncertainty is squeezed out. We're moving towards a death scenario, uh, at which time, you know, at some point in time, if you're tracking these, you say, okay, remember, fail fast, fail smart, let's move on to the next uh, project. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you today. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, and thank you all for joining us.